Today we're diving into a topic that's increasingly shaping our global landscape, the global south. We've discussed the term briefly before, but today we'll look at how this concept has evolved, its historical roots, and the implications it carries in a post-globalized world by synthesizing ideas from two key thinkers on the subject, Arif Derlich and Alfred Lopez. The articles used in the sort as the source material for this lecture are available on Brightspace if you're interested in taking a closer look on your own. Both authors present the Global South as a vital stage of struggle, survival, and potential transformation in a world largely dominated by neoliberal capitalism. Neoliberal capitalism is an economic and political approach that emphasizes free markets, deregulation, privatization, and re a reduced role for government in economic affairs. It promotes the idea that economic growth and efficiency are best achieved when businesses and markets operate with minimal government intervention, allowing supply and demand to dictate prices, wages, and trade. However, the authors approach the topic from slightly different angles. Lopez emphasizes the failure of globalization to deliver on its promises, particularly for the world's marginalized populations. Meanwhile, Derlich explores how the Global South can position itself as a force for reconfiguring global power relations, even as it grapples with its internal contradictions. The term Global South has its historical roots in earlier terms like the Third World, which emerged during the Cold War to describe non-aligned nations, those that weren't part of the capitalist West or the communist East. As Derlich points out, the Third World initially offered a radical vision of liberation, a path to modernity outside of the established capitalist and socialist frameworks. This idea was central to movements in, like the Bandung Conference of 1955, which sought a third way that could avoid the pitfalls of both capitalism and authoritarian socialism. However, as Derlich notes, by the 1980s, that hope that the global South might forge a revolutionary path was displaced by a more disheartening reality. The global economy shifted toward neoliberalism, free markets, deregulation, and privatization, which disproportionately affected the South. The third world became less about liberation and more about the need for the South to be, quote, saved by the North. We see this in the Brandt Commission reports of the 1980s, which suggested massive infusions of capital from the North to the South to prevent global economic collapse. Alfred Lopez provides a complementary but more present-oriented critique of this dynamic. His focus is on what he calls the post-global South, a term he uses to describe the aftermath of globalization. For Lopez, globalization was presented as a rising tide that would lift all boats, a promise that economic integration would bring prosperity to even the most disadvantaged populations. However, the actual outcomes have been far from egalitarian. The marginalized, immigrants, minorities, and the poor are not the beneficiaries of globalization, but its scapegoats. Lopez highlights the failure of globalization as a master narrative, a term he uses to describe the dominant story we've been told, that globalization is inherently good that free markets and global trade will lead to prosperity for everyone. But as he points out, the events of the last few decades, the Asian financial crisis, the collapse of Enron, the war on Iraq, the fiscal crises in places like Argentina, have shown that it's the poorest who suffer most from these global upheavals. So what does Lopez mean by the post-global South? In short, it's the recognition that the era of globalization has failed to deliver its promised benefits and now we must deal with the consequences. He argues that the Global South represents a shared condition of subalternity, of existing on the margins of a world that's been reshaped by neoliberalism. While Lopez is more focused on the critique of globalization's aftermath, Derlich explores the potential for the Global South to chart a new course. He believes that there is still promise in the South, but it's complicated by internal contradictions and external pressures. For instance, Derlich observes that powerful nations like China, India, and Brazil, key players in the global south, are also heavily integrated into the global capitalist system. While these nations have the potential to lead the south in a push for greater autonomy and justice, they are also entangled in the very system that perpetuates equality. 
Derlich discusses the idea of South-South cooperation, a concept that has gained momentum through initiatives like the UNDP's Global South program. This idea suggests that instead of relying on aid from the North, countries in the Global South should work together to solve their own problems. However, Derlich is cautious. He points out that the same forces that push for cooperation among Southern nations, like China and India, also foster competition and create opportunities for manipulation by global powers, particularly the United States. One particularly compelling aspect of Derlich's analysis is his focus on China. He mentions the concept of a Beijing consensus as an alternative to the neoliberal Washington consensus. The Beijing consensus refers to China's ability to integrate into the global economy while maintaining national sovereignty and autonomy. This is seen as a possible model for other countries in the South. However, Derlich warns that China's success comes from its own contradictions, such as growing social inequalities and environmental degradation. So where does this leave us? Both Lopez and Derlich agree that the Global South is not just a geographical location, but a shared condition of marginalization. Lopez talks about the post-global South as a state of living in the aftermath of globalization, a recognition that the neoliberal project has failed the majority of the world's population. Derlich, on the other hand, is more focused on the potential for the Global South to reshape global power dynamics, but he's cautious about the internal and external forces that may undermine this effort. In conclusion, the Global South today is at a crossroads. It can either continue to suffer the consequences of neoliberal globalization or find ways to collaborate and carve out a new global order. The predicament is daunting, but the promise is still there. If the global south can find a way to assert its autonomy while navigating the pressures of global capitalism. Both authors remind us that the path forward won't be easy, but it's a struggle worth pursuing. The future of global justice may very well depend upon it. Shifting gears for the moment, I want to introduce a new concept into our discussion of the cyberpunk genre. There are many derivatives and subgenres of cyberpunk, and these are just a few. Steampunk, think of cyberpunk set in the 19th century, the steam era, often specifically Victorian England. There's lots of clockwork and other gears. Atom punk, if you're familiar with the Fallout franchise, you know Atom punk set in a world with the technology and aesthetics of the 1940s and 1950s. Nanopunk, this is cyberpunk with a particular interest in the possibilities of nanotechnology. Biopunk is another close relative of cyberpunk, but the two focus on different aspects of future technology and its impact on society. Cyberpunk centers around information technology and cybernetics. It typically explores how advancements in computer technology, artificial intelligence, and corporate dominance shape a dystopian world. The themes often involve a clash between high-tech elites and marginalized people, with iconic elements like virtual reality hackers and cybernetic enhancements. The world is gritty, urban, and controlled by megacorporations. Biopunk, on the other hand, emphasizes biotechnology and genetic engineering. Instead of focusing on computers and AI, biopunk explores how manipulating biological systems impacts human bodies, ecosystems, and societies. The genre delves into issues of genetic modification, cloning, and biohacking. The settings often include themes of bodily autonomy, environmental collapse, and corporate or governmental control over human biology. Both cyberpunk and biopunk depict near-future or speculative worlds where technology and capitalism have run amok, often resulting in heightened inequality and systemic exploitation. Topics that resonate deeply with the critiques of globalization discussed by Lopez and Derlich. Cyberpunk is a genre known for its dystopian, highly technologized futures where corporations rule and governments have largely withered away. The settings are often hyper-urbanized with stark divisions, between the wealthy elite and the urban poor who live in sprawling, decaying megacities. This mirrors some of the critiques of globalization and neoliberalism that both Lopez and Derlich discuss. In cyberpunk, the marginalized populations often live in the underbelly of these advanced societies, much like the populations of the global south are situated on the margins of the global economy. 
Think of Gibson's Neuromancer or Scott's Blade Runner. The wealthy live in towering, pristine skyscrapers, while the vast majority scrape by in slums, often disconnected from the privileges of the high-tech world. These settings highlight the failures of capitalism to distribute wealth equitably. Much like the post-global critique Lopez offers, where globalization's promises have failed the majority of the world's population, leaving them to live among the ruins of a world shaped by neoliberal policies. Cyberpunk's portrayal of high-tech, low-life societies echoes the notion of the post-global South, where the marginalized are not beneficiaries of technological progress, but rather its victims. The subaltern in these worlds, hackers, low-level workers, and immigrants, are often portrayed as struggling to survive in a world that's been reshaped by corporate interests. This mirrors Lopez's idea of the post-global South as a condition of being left behind by globalization. In fact, many of the characters in cyberpunk narratives could be seen as representing a kind of urban global south, trapped in a system that privileges the few and marginalizes the many. Furthermore, cyberpunk's focus on corporate power over nation states parallels the way neoliberal globalization has empowered transnational corporations at the expense of national sovereignty, a critique both Derlick and Lopez offer. The corporations in cyberpunk worlds often act as de facto governments controlling resources in people's lives in ways that recall the economic domination of the global south by multinational corporations. For instance, the powerful dystopian corporations of the Matrix or Ghost in the Shell function similarly to the global economic institutions like the IMF or World Bank that Derlich critiques for exacerbating inequalities in the global south. Biopunk as a subgenre of cyberpunk focuses on the implications of biotechnology and genetic manipulation, often exploring how these technologies affect human bodies and the environment. The genre's themes of bodily control, genetic modification, and biocapitalism resonate deeply with issues of inequality and exploitation discussed by Lopez and Dirk. In biopunk, marginalized characters often experience invasive technologies that control or modify their bodies, much like how populations in the global south have historically been exploited for cheap labor or subjected to environmental degradation under globalization. For example, Paolo Basigalupi's The Wind-Up Girl presents a future where genetic engineering has reshaped the world's food supply, leading to corporate control over entire ecosystems. In this world, people in regions like Southeast Asia, part of the Global South, are particularly vulnerable to these manipulations, a scenario not far removed from current fears of corporate control over genetically modified crops and biotechnologies in the real world Global South. Lopez's concept of the post-Global South can be extended to Biopunk's visions of a post-human future, where those on the margins are not only economically disadvantaged, but also biologically modified in ways that reflect their subaltern status. For example, the protagonists in many biopunk stories are often find their bodies altered or controlled by powerful elites, echoing how Lopez describes the poor and marginalized populations of the Global South as being the most vulnerable to the negative effects of globalization. The manipulation of bio biology in biopunk, whether through genetic engineering or cyborg enhancements, can be seen as a metaphor for the broader manipulation of populations under neoliberal capitalism. Derlich's discussion of the South-South cooperation and the potential for alternative futures within the Global South also ties into biopunk's exploration of alternative forms of existence. While the genre often presents dystopian outcomes, it also offers glimpses of resistance and innovation. Just as Derlich suggests that the Global South might offer new models of economic and political organization, biopunk stories often feature characters or groups who rebel against the corporate or governmental control of their bodies, seeking autonomy or alternative ways of living. Both cyberpunk and biopunk function as speculative mirrors of the real-world issues facing the Global South. They amplify the themes of exploitation, inequality, and the failures of globalization that Derlich and Lopez discuss by placing them in futuristic, technologically advanced settings. These genres push the questions raised by the Global South even further, 
What happens when technology, instead of leveling the playing field, exacerbates inequality? What forms of resistance or survival are available to those left behind? In the end, these genres offer a way to critically engage with the dilemmas posed by globalization and neoliberalism. They ask us to imagine what a post-global future might look like and whether it's possible to find justice and autonomy in a world dominated by technology and corporate power. Just as Derlich and Lopez suggest that the global south might be a site for both predicament and promise, cyberpunk and biopunk reveal the potential for both dystopia and resistance in the face of overwhelming forces. By engaging with these speculative genres, we can better understand the stakes of our present world and the challenges that lie ahead in reimagining a future where the marginalized and the exploited can reclaim power and agency.